Yeah, it's good to see you guys this morning, worship team. Thank you so much. Yeah. Y'all doing okay? Thanks, Dano. Huh? How, let me ask y'all. Y'all doing okay? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gravy. I don't want to get you too riled up. You may yell at me. Right? Anybody know what we're talking about? <clears throat> well, today I'm going to finish it up. Seriously? No, I, I, I am going to do it, Frank. I'm telling you right now. Listen, what up, girl? Good to see you. Well, let's dig right in. Uh, get, find Romans 13. I've got these last, what, 13, 14, 15, 16. I think, that's, I think there's 16. Let me kind of set this up for you because last week we kind of concluded in chapter 12 of Romans where Paul is instructing the church. You remember he starts out with telling the body of Christ to present their, their selves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Tracy remembers? Okay. It's going to be one of them Sundays. Huh? All right. Well, let me, let me remind you of this. The Lord is asking us today to present our bodies. How many, of you, how many of you did that this week? See, we don't think about this stuff, do we? We get busy. We find ourselves doing all kinds of stuff. And then to actually stop for a second and think, Lord, I'm offering my life to you this week. We don't do that. And then all of a sudden we read the scripture and we get reminded, oh, daggone it, Lord, I forgot to offer. You know, I, you know what, I, you, you know my heart, though, Lord. <laughs> yeah. And so he's reminding them, take the time. Block out some time in your day for God, whether it's five minutes or two hours. God is not hung up on that. What he's looking for is this loyal heart to say, you know what, Lord? This is what I remember right now. I'm going to take some time for you. And it's not for you to come get something. It's actually you want to come into the Lord's presence and honor him. Sometimes it's, it's just being quiet. How many of you have ever tried to be quiet? <laughs> now, now, wait a minute. I don't mean, I'm talking about in the presence of the Lord. I know you can't do it in the natural well, let, let me rephrase that. Sometimes if you're married and, you, and, the other one is, and the other one's mad, then all of a sudden there's quiet time going on. <laughs> you ever had the silent treatment served up on you? You ever done it to somebody? <laughs> and, and it goes from silent treatment to lying. What's wrong? Nothing. <clears throat> yeah. What God is looking for, and one of the things that he's trying to do with this letter to the church as he concludes these last chapters, is he's encouraging them in practical Christian living. You remember in chapter 12 last week, he said, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with others. I like that he put in there, as much as depends on you. Because he knows sometimes <clears throat> you're not going to succeed at it, right? There will be times when we, um, when we make mistakes and the Lord has to remind us. I think the question is, are we willing to listen when he does remind us? Let me ask you this this morning. Since I'm already meddling in your lives, how many of you are hard-headed? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of people put their hand up. <laughs> we have a tendency, especially when we get used to things a certain way. And this is why, Paul, if you read, and when you have time, go back and go through chapter 12 again, because he gives us a whole list. And he starts out with, in the middle of this chapter with this, don't let love be hypocritical. In other words, be real about it. God knows where you're at. What people need, you know what they need? Just like this video, they just showed the woman at the well. One of my favorite Bible stories. Because she is us. And Jesus is just displaying the love of the Father to a lost, broken world that has tried everything they can. And they're just, they're just, they've got one nostril above water trying to, trying to keep life going. And what we need is to understand that God loves us in those times. When everything isn't going right, when you have failed miserably for the thousandth time, 
You know, like he told the lady, oh, yeah, and the, and the dude you got now that you're shacking up with, not your husband. And she goes, oh, you must be a prophet. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, and the Lord, he, he just extends that love to her. And this is what I believe the world needs to see in us. Now, obviously, if you've, you know, spent time in Romans, you know there is discipline and correction that God brings to all of us. We don't like that, but he brings it to us because God, whom God loves, he disciplines. And then going into chapter 13, after he's given us these simple Christian instructions on how to live the Christian life. Not legalistic. These are things that we grow in. He knows that you're not just going to wake up tomorrow and walk in all of this. That's why he started chapter 12, present your body a living sacrifice. Renew your mind to the things of God so that you can prove the will of God. And then when he goes into chapter 13, then he gets really, uh, <clears throat> I know there are people that thinks that the church and the political world should be separate, but I guess they didn't read Romans 13. So he got quiet. Some of them's like, oh, no, he's going to talk about politics. <laughs> Listen, you, it's not like you don't know where I stand on this issue. You have heard me many times, but instead of me saying something, let me read the letter from the Apostle Paul in chapter 13. Amen? Verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist, they are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on their self. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Because when you have corruption in the political world, what are you supposed to do? Well, y'all getting ahead of yourself there. Hang on. <laughs> the first thing you need to understand, Paul is not talking about people. He's talking about the office. The political office that has been established by him. That ordinance. He's not, you, you understand, uh, good people come and go. Well, we haven't had good in a long time, but... There, there's so much corruption in the political world today. It's, it's actually, it is so demon-driven, and, and the church is absolutely blind to it. We just do what we've always done, and we listen to the big three. Y'all know what the big three are? A, B, C, N, B, C, C. And they tell you what to do and who to vote for, and you say, okay. <laughs> they tell you which one to like and which one not to like. And when you buy that, thank God for social media because today there is this phrase called independent journalism. Y'all ever heard of it? Some of you have, some of you like, what is that? Those are, those are conspiracy theories. In the Old Testament, they called them prophets. <laughs> some are laughing, some are like, that's not funny, Reverend. <laughs> no, it's a little funny. Especially with the landscape of what we're dealing with today. Understand, Paul is addressing the office that God has ordained. And this is the thing. We need to know who we are as people of God so that we can be proper citizens representing the kingdom of God. Listen to the message paraphrase. Be a good citizen. All governments are under God. Insofar as there is peace and order, it's God's order. So live as responsible citizens. You know, the Bible says that when the righteous are in charge, the people rejoice. So what about when the righteous aren't in charge? That's when you need to understand who you are and pray. Not criticize. Not be, not be so critical all the time of an individual that is standing in an office that, that he probably shouldn't have been in. Huh? See, Paul is talking, when he is addressing this issue going into 13, he's addressing the laws of the land. You see, you're supposed to obey the laws of the land. It's, it's just like, you, know, you remember I've told you, my dad used to be a police officer when I was little. And you all have watched movies before. You, have, you, got, you got the good cop in the back. You, there's, you know, there are, some, there are bad police officers that's, that's gone through there. And hopefully when you have the right leadership, you kind of weed that stuff out. Let me tell you a quick story about me because I always wasn't a Christian <laughs> and way back in I think I was I don't even know if I was 18 
and I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. You ever been to the wrong place at the wrong time? And, 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 and some things went down, and the police showed up, and, and they were asking everybody stuff. And, and I'm trying to be the good friend and not rat on anybody. And so if they throw me in the back of, of a cruiser, and, they, and I, this is way down in the, in the backwoods of Louisiana, and they take me, to, uh, y'all may not know what a rock quarry is, but now these, this, this is the police, <laughs> and they take me to the rock quarry. <laughs> and they say, boy, you going to tell us what we want to know. <laughs> I'm 17. I'm about tore up. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't know anything. And finally, they took me back to town. That was not a good cop. How many of y'all know? Huh? I know some people may say, oh, no, that's, def- that would, that's the, definitely the way. No, it's not the way to go. <laughs> not for a 17-year-old kid. <laughs> I was terrified. I had a bad image of police officers after that. I'm like, man, are they all? Of course, my dad was one, so I knew they weren't all like that. But it's that badge that you have to honor. You understand me? I know there may be a messed up something, but the, but the office whether it's the police, whether it's the governing authorities, you honor the position. And I think in the landscape of everything going on in our society today, maybe the church has missed this. All right, let, let, me, have, uh, let me have that passage, uh, in Ricky, and uh, Timothy. It's on down a little bit somewhere in there. Yeah, here we go. Because Paul knew that we would be struggling with some of these things. And so he's writing this letter to this young minister. And he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. You see, when things aren't going right, you all, this is the thing that we learn from Daniel. Daniel was under one of the most corrupt governments that ever existed. There wasn't even any voting that was going on. You know, the king, the emperor was just installed. And Daniel is in this government. And what's what's crazy is God positions him inside that government, that that busted system. And so Daniel's praying. Not for not just I mean he's praying for his people obviously. But he's praying for God's hand to be on him and everything that's going on. And the Lord begins to use him to change the course of a situation. What if God tapped you on the shoulder for you to be involved in something in that world? I mean, it was really quiet with that. Like, oh, no, Reverend. (laughs) No. You know why the political world is so jacked up? Because the church unhooked from it. The reason it is so twisted, the reason the kingdom of darkness has such a stronghold on the political world is because the church unhooked. Because you had some demon-influenced people at some point say, well, the church and the state should separate. You all know better than that. That's not biblical. And it wasn't the way this nation was founded. I know there's some people that try to teach that garbage. Go study history. And not the history that they're just now writing to say what the history used to be. I'm talking about actual history. You can find out real quick where we came from. And what God is looking for today is the church to rise up and be who we're supposed to be. And that doesn't mean getting out and acting stupid with a sign on a campus. That's a clown show. And it's the people running the thing that's driving the car. Anyway, it's not my message. Y'all quit quit meddling with me. Paul wants us to understand as people of God, our role is to intercede for leadership. You know you can pray somebody out. Huh? Now, there may be some some people that's there for a reason that God's doing something. Remember God, the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart for a reason. Right? Right? 
So there may be some stuff. We don't know everything. We see through a lens very dimly with everything going on. And so our job as a believer, when, when you see, uh, this is Paul's point when he's telling, in, in chapter 3, when he's introducing this thought, guys, the reason I'm telling you about this is you need to be honorable people and pray for the people in office. Honor the office. Be subject to it. But now anytime somebody in an office, if you'll go look at, you remember Acts Chapter 5, you can go check it out later, don't go there, but in Acts chapter 5, Peter and some of the apostles got arrested for preaching. Y'all don't know nothing about that today. We have never been threatened with being arrested for preaching. They may talk about you on social media for preaching something, but arrested? Mm Mm-mm. My man and his crew are arrested, and then they get taken before the Sanhedrin and the courts in in uh, in that city And they're telling them that you're not going to do this anymore. And you all know what Peter said? He said, it is better for us to obey God than the laws of man. So anytime, listen very carefully, anytime a law of God asks you to disobey, or a law of man asks you to disobey a law of God, that law doesn't count. No. Okay. Okay. No, so I don't have, some of you are like, no, but we're supposed to, yeah, but if they're telling you to disobey God, I don't care what kind of uniform they got on. I don't care what office they stand in, not, not doing it. No. <laughs> A couple of you nodding heads, some are like, yeah, but what if I get in trouble? These dudes were arrested for preaching. Guys, if things, help me, Holy Spirit, true. If, 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 the, if things in the landscape of our nation do not change, don't think they're not coming for you. Don't think they won't tell you you can't gather. They've already tried it once with their pandemic. Don't th- listen to me. If the church doesn't stand up, it's time we stop trying to have a wishbone and get a backbone. <laughs> because if we, the next year, your, your children, they won't be able to do this. It'll be an organized, government-appointed church. Just like countries all over this place have had for for centuries and centuries before us. Well, you can do this. You can have this organized religion. You can do these as long as we sign off on it. If we don't, the next generation, they're going to look back on us when they get to heaven and like, Dad, Mom, Papa, what would y'all do? Oh, we gathered in our four walls and sang kumbaya. Oh, let me feel the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And then we go right back to our same old, same old. And nothing changes. Huh? Now, we do this in love. We do it the right way because if you follow Paul, he goes immediately into verse 7 and he says, Render to all their due, give honor to who honor is due. Andy allowed me the privilege of preaching to the youth Wednesday night. That was a different experience. And then I realized where they got it because they were all sitting there staring at me just like their parents do. (laughs) Yeah. See, some of you laughing, some of you like, <laughs> still staring, baby. God wants us to be honorable people, but he wants us extending honor to people. Even when you see someone in an office, in a position that you don't like, approve of, or agree with, but because they stand in that office, you walk in a level of honor with them. Y'all getting this? I'm telling you, it will go so much further with the church. That's, why the, that's what the world doesn't understand with all their protests and all that carnal, dumb stuff. That, never, that is never in the history of humanity worked. Never. But when people are honorable and they walk in love, it will provide you an audience. Because God will honor your, whom you understand, the Lord will honor your faithfulness. And Paul then continues reminding them again. Because he's dealing with all, there's so many little sections that he deals with in these last few chapters as he wraps up his instructions to this church. And he's reminding them again about things going on in the church. When you get down into 8 through 14 and some of those verses, Paul is trying to help people understand. Because a lot of the, remember the religious world, they're still trying to get them to operate under the Old Testament law. 
And they've been, now remember what has Paul been preaching from verse 1, from chapter 1 all the way through, that you've been justified freely by the sacrifice of Jesus. And he's letting them know, guys, that love has to be. As a matter of fact, he says that all the law can be summed up in this one statement, you shall love your neighbor. See, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from them. Huh? You're not going to cheat on them if you love your neighbor. I've had, I've had couples in my office before, you know, that have failed in their marriage. And, oh, I, I, I love her or him, but I'm like, not on that day. No, no. Something happened. See, learning this role of love is something that has to grow inside you. Paul continually is bringing this young church back to this foundation of love and unity. That's just one of the things highlighted in chapter 13. He's simply offering some guidelines, if you will, for a, a, a man's conscience. I want you to think about this because he talks about different foods. See, one of the things that has been uh, the, the, the church was attacked with is different foods that they were eating. And Paul's like, are you serious right now talking about food? What did Jesus say about food? He said it's not what goes in a man that defiles a man. It's what? It's what comes out. Huh? It's, it's the stuff you, you, you're saying is what's destroying you. And Paul is dealing with them, and he says, but, he, he says, but for conscience' sake, I need you to be aware of other people. He says, and, and he, you know, he really he takes them back to chapter 2 where he really dealt with them. And he says this, because he calls them out on the same stuff here as he did in chapter 2. And he says, who are you to judge another servant? Huh? How about us? How we do with that? Y'all look real spiritual this morning. Listen, I can tell you as your pastor, we don't do good at it. We're very quick to judge somebody else. Very quick. Paul says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master, he stands or he falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God's able to make him stand. See, so often we see the thing that we don't agree with in someone else's life, that we don't approve of, that we don't sign off on, and we we conclude in our mind that we got it all together. You're adorable. (laughs) No, nobody in this room's got it all. Let's be real for a second. That's why Paul makes statements like, it is only by the grace of God that I am who I am. That's it. Thank God for his grace and mercy. See, Paul is dealing with this church, and he knows because of the religious stuff that keeps getting pushed down their throat. He understands that they're not all on the same page with these things. They're trying to push different things that don't line up with, with New Testament covenant. They're trying to bring Old Testament things back into play. And guys, there's nothing wrong with conviction about something. You know, if, if you've read something in the Old Testament and you're, you know, they're, they're dealing with some diet stuff, different things going on. If you're dealing with something that convicts you, then that's between you and the Lord. Work it out. But don't try to push that conviction on somebody else. We don't know all of it right now. We, we see very dimly the, the, the mysteries and the truths of God outside of what the Word shows us. Listen to uh, chapter uh, 14. Let's move into it a little bit. Listen to this. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. Hold up. Now, we need to take a minute here. As I was thinking about this passage this morning, I don't really think we, you know, I I really don't, Andy, I don't think we give this a lot of thought, that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I need you to take a second and wrap your head around this. When all this is done, let let me read it again. Verse 11, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow. (laughs) 
Huh? And every tongue will confess. So then, each of you shall give an account of himself. <laughs> I'm like, is that some? That sounded like somebody from the chosen. One of them. I was like, is that Jesus from the chosen talking to me? Here, here's what I want you to, to, to take a second and, and let this marinate. Let's say to, just use your imagination with me for a second, okay? Let's say today is our last day. Some of you, some of you puckered up right there like, oh, wow. And then you're standing before Jesus. You ever th- now, understand, because Paul talks about in Romans, there is no condemnation. Remember chapter 8, for those of us who are in Christ? But on that day, there is going to be judgment. Now, not judgment of your sin. You have, Jesus has already judged that. You understand? You are, th- this is Paul's point. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What he's going to judge you for are the things that he asked you to do while you were on the planet. How many of you told the Lord no before? I got five honest people, the rest of y'all lying, church, down my Lord. No, you, I know, you just didn't want to say nothing. Listen, all of us have told, you may not have used the words no, but listen, all of us have told the Lord no. And I'm not talking about just doing things inside this campus here when, when, when the Lord. Now, obviously, we're supposed to be doing things here for sure. But we're the, you understand, we're the body Monday through Saturday. And there are things that God's going to ask you to do. And there are reward for when you do them. This is the thing. You heard me say this so many times. When those are passed out, you remember the, the, the parable in Luke? You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to make you ruler over ten cities. Ten cities, Ronnie. Huh? Some of y'all never did run anything, but you've been this mighty servant of the Lord, and now all of a sudden you get promoted. You see, Daniel didn't run anything in the beginning. Joseph, I mean, Joseph had it so bad in his difficulties, his, his own brothers tried to kill him. Is that messed up family stuff? And then instead of killing him, you know, they said, well, let's just sell him as a slave. Huh? And they took him back to Egypt, and Potiphar bought him. And, I mean, it just went, every time the Lord would raise him up, boom. Raise him up, he finally winds up in prison. And then in prison, the Lord began to prepare him. But you know, two days before the Lord, before Joseph got called up to the big leagues, he was still in prison. He was still in his mess. He was still struggling. Nothing seemed to be going right. But even there, he didn't let that get him. And God honored that stuff in his life. See, God will honor you this side of heaven. But I'm telling you, there's going to be something that happens on the other side of heaven. We all, when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, this is what Paul wants us to get today. This is what he's trying to get this church to realize. Guys, honor the Lord. Honor him. Say yes. You don't have to force stuff. He's, he's dealing with these things, trying to get this church. Quit trying to push all this religious stuff on them. There was this group that that was what they were continually doing. You got to do this. You got to eat this. You can't eat that. I'm like, thank God. I, can, I mean, we were. In, I was over in the youth group the other night. And we were. They, Andy was talking about their. Is that today or next week? Did we get the fried chicken? Oh, so I. I think Skylar yelled out fried chicken. I'm like, yes, man. Praise Jesus. Not pizza. Fried. No fried chicken. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right then. I got excited for a minute, you know, because we, but un- unlike what Paul is dealing with, some people, they're not allowed to eat certain things, you know. And Paul wants them to understand. He says, as a matter of fact, he says this in verse 17, guys, the kingdom of heaven's not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, and peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What's the kingdom of heaven? It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Man. I think the church needs to have a little bit more fun with their life. Now, when I say this, 
Yes, we need to be serious about the things of God. But that doesn't mean you can't be seriously fun about being serious about the things of God. You can do it with a smile on. You can cut up. You can have a big time. Now, I know we face challenges and we go through sorrows and difficulties. The Bible says, yeah, weeping may endure for a night. Thank you, babe. Well, what comes in the morning? In the morning. Say in the morning. Yeah. See, in the morning there should, there should be some joy showing up at your house. But if you never tap into it, if you just keep going around the same mountain, well, Lord, you know, I've been believing for six months, for five years. And yeah. I know we want instant stuff. And I know we see instant stuff with Jesus. But, you know, understand now Jesus lives in heaven and his spirit lives in us and he's got to operate through us. And sometimes we're only run, <laughs> Amanda, sometimes we're only running at 20%. Jesus operated at 100%. Yeah, we just, we, we got, we got a little, you know, a little dabble, do you? Uh, all the older people are like, oh, I get that. <clears throat> he continually reminds us to pursue peace, guys. He, he actually takes it a step further, not only pursue peace, but per, pursue things that edify one another. And then he sums up chapter 14 in verse 21, and he says this. It's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles. What did he say? Whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, if it makes your brother stumble, he's talking about your conscience. This is why you and I, we have to be aware of what we do. Even though we can do it. That doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. You, you got that? This is what Paul wants us to, to understand. As the church today, there are people in this room, we are at all, all of us are at different levels of faith, and we're growing. This is what the grace of God is so amazing about. This is why we are the righteousness of God. The church needs a revelation of who they are. In God. God loves you. He loves you. He knows you're going to make mistakes. And it doesn't matter how long you've walked with the Lord. I mean, I've been with God for a minute now, and I still do dumb stuff. I was doing real good in traffic the other day. See, why, too many of y'all laugh at traffic. I guess y'all deal with traffic. Bettina, you probably don't deal with traffic, do you? <laughs> Listen, all of a sudden, this guy, he pulls out in front of me. First of all, I'm doing, I, I'm doing a speed limit, <laughs> right? And he, and it's like, of course, you, you got to take a second because I, you know, when I get close enough to his bumper that I can see his white hair, I realize he's probably just an old grandpa in his truck, just out cruising, not even paying a, you know. And he just pulls out in front of me, hand out the window. And I'm, I'm, about, I'm standing on my brakes to stop, and then I push the gas to let him know. I, I know y'all wouldn't do that. <laughs> See, there's way too, much, way too much going on. See, some of you are laughing. Some of you are just staring at me like, I would never do that, Reverend. <laughs> okay, well, then you need to pray for me. Because I'm still working this stuff out. I'm using me as an example because, see, I still, I, I, I'm the preacher. I should at least have traffic down by now. I'm like, Lord, you got to help a brother with this, man. That's why we don't have, uh, we don't have Victory Life bunk, nothing to put on your car. No. Uh-uh. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'd be getting phone calls. <laughs> I remember, I remember a few years ago, this was before Dr. Wilkins was, uh, was the doctor. You know, he was still in the police force, and he's in court one day. Somebody's being, uh, being arrested, and he's standing before the judge. Trevor sends me a selfie. This dude's up there with a Victory Life t-shirt on, Get, <laughs> getting ready to go to jail. I'm like, okay. We love them all, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I know. Guys, here's the thing, you know, 
God knows this about us. Now, will he correct you 100%? But he wants us. That laughter that we're having, he wants that. A merry heart does good like medicine. You shouldn't be so serious about life that you can't enjoy life. This is the joy of the Holy Spirit inside you. And once you start yielding to it, it'll flow out of you to other people. And then you'll get an opportunity to share the gospel. Not, that's the thing that Paul wants. See, these guys are still trying to cram all their religious practices down these people's throat. You better do good. You better be right. You better eat this. You better not eat that. You better not talk that way. You better not go over that. I'm like, good Lord, man. Now, as you grow with God, those things will, will go away. You'll learn how to overcome. I mean, obviously, you can see me. I haven't won traffic yet. But it's not, it's not like traffic has a stronghold on me. I just, I don't have control over my human carnal nature. I give in to it. That's why some of y'all still cuss the way you do. Oh, I couldn't help it, Reverend. I was, you know, it just came out. It just came out. <laughs> you, you know the whole sponge thing with chocolate milk? Put the sponge in chocolate milk, put pressure on the sponge. Kool-Aid ain't coming out. Uh, yeah. A bunch of heads went down when I started talking about cussing. Like, oh, oh no, he's on that again. <laughs> See, what Paul wants every one of us, whatever it is, because we all, you know the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So let's just get real for a second. We got some sin going on up in this joint, okay? Let's just be real for a second. All of us dealing with something. This is why we are not to be critical in judging other people, but we are to edify and encourage other people. And when they're ready to receive, the Lord will help you with that. But in the meantime, let's just remember, God is way more patient than we are. And then you go into chapter 15. Yeah, I'm going to make it. Stay with me. I only got, I only got 15 to 16 left. But Paul, in, in chapter 15, Paul is reminding the Roman church, guys, listen, which means he's reminding us today that those of us that are strong in our faith, we are to look out for those that are weak. So that we can do what? Edify them. This is what God wants the church to understand today. Those of you that have walked with the Lord for a while, instead of highlighting somebody's stuff all the time. See, this is the thing I wanted to do with the youth on Wednesday night. Because I'm praying about I used to be a youth pastor, and, well, you know, I mean, they, they'll listen to you for about two minutes. And then they, so you got to pray for Andy and Kate because after a couple of minutes, they'd check out. They're talking to their friends, laughing at you. They found out whole, I mean, they found out that uh, they, like, Kate was in your youth group. You old. <laughs> I'm like, ow. <laughs> well, teenagers, they, you know, they just tell you stuff. And so the Lord, you know, Lord, I'm asking, I'm like, what do you want me to tell these kids, Lord? He said, I want you to honor them and tell them how proud I am of them. Yeah, but God, they're not doing right. (laughs) They're, you know, they're teenagers. I mean, they're smart aleck, you know. I'm like, you mean like their parents? (laughs) I'm telling you guys, this this letter to the Roman church, it's simply this letter of reminding those of us that are spiritual Remember what Peter says, those of you who are spiritual, you need to be the first one to go restore somebody that's overtaken in a fall. (laughs) Cody, we do not do that, man. No, sir. Well, if you'd been walking a little closer with the Lord, the anointing would have been on you. Oh, my gosh. I've seen the anointing on people, and they weren't even around the Lord. The Lord, you, you understand, the Lord will use a heathen. Y'all remember in my, in my gatekeeper series, God anointed Cyrus, a heathen king, to go help his people be sent. So we try to, in our religious way of thinking, we try to put those two together. <laughs> That's, you know, wow. <clears throat> Jack said, even the donkey. <laughs> you right? Yeah. So we have to look out for people today. I got this phrase from my wife years ago. She said, you need to be otherly. Now, I know otherly isn't a word. You know, when I typed it in my iPad, you know, how it highlights it, it's not, you know, it's like I thought, did I misspell it? And I'm like, no, I didn't. Mis- it's not a word. What's a word now? Huh? Be otherly. Y'all know what be otherly means? Put others first. Think about other people. 
You ever done that? You ever, you ever, I, I know we're good at putting people in their place. What if you put yourself in their place instead? Try to relate to what they're going through, what they're fighting, what their battle is, what their struggle might be. Huh? See, sometimes what God needs from those of us that are growing a little bit in our faith and we understand what righteousness really is, that he's got us, that I am right with God, that we go help them. Not that we're giving them, a, you know, the stamp of approval for the, the, the bad lifestyle they have. That's not what, I'm not saying that. That's not what the Bible teaches. But it's in the middle of their stuff. When they've been trying and trying and trying and they, they do it wrong and they don't comprehend and they're, you, you go get in the, in the ditch with them. Oh, wait a minute. That's the story of the Good Samaritan. Oh, yeah. You know who walked by? The preacher walked by. The religious people walked by. The Samaritan, he got in the ditch with the guy. Got him. I think sometimes... God just, you know, he's not impressed with your theology. He's not impressed with your faith scriptures that you got stuck on your refrigerator. You know what he's impressed with sometimes? When you're ready to get down and dirty with somebody and get in the ditch with them. Say, I got you, man. Come on. Huh? See, Jesus tells us, if you follow him, you remember the story of James and John. And if you watch the chosen episode where they're all talking about, well, we want to sit on his right hand and his left. Yeah, well, you know, they had, they had a little zeal about them. Sons of thunder, yeah, you know. <laughs> Jesus says, hey, in my kingdom, if you want to be great, somebody tell me what he said. Be a what? Be a servant. See, I think sometimes in, in the uh, entitlement church that we live in today, taking on a servant role, well, I'm, I'm above that now. No, you're not. We just did our lobby out here a few, uh, maybe two months ago, and I'm right up in the middle of it. It'd been real easy for me to tell, st- tell my staff, well, y'all handle that. I am the guy. But I'm not that guy because, I, you know, I, I, I'll never be that guy. I, I'll get right in the middle of it, and, and you know, and then I, I couldn't even walk when I was done. I'm like, man. I mean, I'm going to Dr. Mills right now for chiropractic stuff. I'm like, Lord, still hurting, man. I mean. This getting old stuff is not for the faint of heart. Yeah? See, Jesus wants us to understand what he's looking for are just faithful people that take on that servant mentality. He goes on to encourage them to be like-minded with one another. Listen to this in chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound. This word hope, this word hope is a, a, is a fixed expectation. What are you expecting from God? May the God of your expectation fill you with joy in, and peace in believing it. What are you believing God for today? Then in verse 14, he admonishes them for their goodness. He says, guys, you are doing good. Remember when you go back, when he started, he said, I just want to let you all know, your faith is famous all over the world. Paul was encouraging them. He said, and now I myself and am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and you are able to admonish one another. You are able to encourage one another. But that word admonish, it doesn't mean just encouragement. It also means to challenge or to correct, to, to give a warning, say, hey, let, let's, let's, Let's work on this area a little bit. The Lord ever told you to work on something a little bit? And then Paul concludes his letter by making this statement, just reaffirming. Now, this this part, I just want to highlight it real quick, and then I'm going to move on to chapter 16. But Paul's just kind of just reaffirming his role because he's writing this letter to this church, and the overwhelming majority of the people, they don't even know who Paul is. They've heard about him. And he says this in chapter 15, verse 17. Therefore, I have, I have reason to glory in Christ in the things which pertain to God. For I will not speak of anything which Christ has not accomplished through me. He's saying, guys, the stuff I'm talking about, the stuff I'm dealing with you about, the Lord's already dealt with me about it. He's already, he's already done these things in my life. He goes on to say, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit so that from Jerusalem, to uh, what is that word there? Illyricum? 
I have fully preached the gospel. He's kind of giving him, or, or the, this young church here, guys, listen, I've been there, done that. I'm not just writing this. I've experienced it. And I've made it a name to preach the gospel in places where Christ isn't named. Now, this is kind of an ethical statement here. He said, I'm not doing stuff on, in towns where somebody else has already been there. I'm not going to start another work where somebody else is already doing the work. That's something that preachers can learn today. I can't tell you the number of times I've watched somebody, well, I'm called into the ministry, Reverend, and they leave that church and they go right down the street and start another one. Nope. Not the right thing to do. If you're called into the ministry, then God's going to send you somewhere not to cause grief in another body somewhere. Yeah, you got that? And then he asked those, pray for me. He says, I beg you, verse 30, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayer. This is, this is any, any minister's heart's cry is for their, their people to pray for them. You should pray for me. Not just criticize me, but pray for me. This is the thing that Paul wants, he's wanting this church to understand. As he's concluding this letter, he's saying, guys, I, I, I need your prayers for, for, for my assignment. And then he goes into chapter 16. And here's the thing. Just like Paul told us earlier, he said, give honor to whom honors do. Well, chapter 16, you all, chapter 16 is this long list of faithful people that have served Paul. They have helped him advance the gospel in all these different regions, and he's highlighting them. Some of these people, they know them. He said, these guys right here, this is the reason I am what I am today. It's because these people have made this possible for me. See, ultimately, this is what sums up the body of Christ. When you go back to chapter 12, that's what Paul highlights. Guys, we are one body, many members of that one body. He's saying, as a faithful member of the body, stay committed, stay hooked up, look out for one another. He said, remember God's assignment. So here's the thing I want you to see. Paul is establishing some foundational principles in this letter. From the, really, from the beginning to the end, he is highlighting some simple truths like this. The power of the gospel is the only answer. He's wanting people to understand, and he wants this young church to realize that his primary focus with Romans is the righteousness of God. And that, that, that it is driven by faith, which is really, it's, it's justification by faith, is really what Paul drives through this whole talk. You have been justified freely. Today, if you have Jesus in your life, you have, you have been made just as righteous as anybody else in this room. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. The religious world chokes on this. I am telling you, some of you all probably choke on it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, but what about when I go and, and, and do the wrong thing? Stop all that what if stuff, man. You're going to do wrong stuff. Remember what I told you a while ago? Paul says, whatever isn't of faith is sin. So there's times when you sin in and you didn't actually do anything wrong, but if you're not operating in a level of faith that God has revealed to you, according to what Paul said, this is why you have to, by faith, accept it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He is the God who sets things right. And he did this by one way, by Jesus Christ. If you're in this room today, I want you understanding, if you're listening or watching today, it is only through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew and also for the Greek, Paul makes it very clear the gospel is the power of God. See, guys, let me share this with you. And you've heard me say this many times. But you don't have to force it. You don't. I, I know that there are people that tell you, well, you've got to go out witnessing. I've actually had... Frank, I've actually had people, I don't know if y'all ever been in sales or not, and you got to do that, that hard sale or that hard close. Well, what's it going to do? What can we do today to get this deal done? What's it going to take? For this? What can we do to get the deal? And, and I've had people preach the gospel. I'm like, that's not, that doesn't work. You don't have to force this stuff. 
I know there are religious people that practice this. Well, we're going street witnessing. Okay, well, go ahead. And that's great. And if you're Holy Spirit led to say something to somebody, wonderful. But if you're just trying to force the gospel with your sign. Now, now listen, don't. And now if you know somebody that does this, don't you go be critical of them for doing it. I'm teaching you as my sheep. There is a different way. There is a better way. Holy Spirit, them that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And he will lead you to people that their heart is ready. You're not going to force it. I know some people think, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to force it. Well, let me know how that's working out for you. Paul wants us to understand, the Holy Spirit wants us to understand today, there is a power that comes with the gospel. And all you've got to do is be led and tell people that. And you don't have to give scriptural references. You don't have to say my preacher said or the Bible said. You just go tell them the word of God. You go preach the gospel. Tell them your story. Here's the thing I want to encourage you with. Have your story ready. Be ready. What did Paul tell Timothy? Be ready in season and out of season. And then Paul wraps up this chapter in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 25. He says, now to him who's able to establish you. See, Paul, this, he's, he's encouraging them one more time. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You see, you've got the preaching of Jesus, and then on what comes next is the revelation of the mystery of who, who we are in Christ. He says, verse 26, but now it's been made manifest, things that the prophets talked about by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandments of the everlasting God for the obedience of faith. To God alone be the glory. See, I think God wants us understanding today that when this is all said and done, regardless of where you're at in your journey of faith, the religious stuff doesn't work. Romans is from, from, from 1 to 16, Paul continually drives this home. Your religious practices will never advance the kingdom of heaven. But the power of the gospel flowing through someone that believes in it, it goes to work. That's how the kingdom works. And so I'm encouraging all of you today, when you leave here, be ready. If you're at the restaurant, be looking. That doesn't mean you can't have fun and have all the, the chips and queso you want. But stay on. Brother Hagin used to tell us this all the time. Keep the switch of faith on. Stay on. When you're out in society, stay on. Be ready. Lord, you want me to say that to them now? N now. That's the Holy Spirit. Led. That's how it works, you all. And, and when you follow that and you share your little story, boom. The power of the gospel shows up. And then don't try to help God, okay? Once you, do, once you do what he told you to do, you know what we do a lot of times? We, we sit there and wait. All right, you got to, what, what's going to happen now? No, no, no. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man sow to seed. Do your part and then be on your way. If you're at a restaurant and you did your part, leave a fat tip on the way out. Huh? Not a track. Not an invitation card. Fat tip. Come on. Huh? I got to unhook, man. Y'all actually helped me preach this thing today. <clears throat> if you're here this morning and you've never given Jesus a chance, maybe you're watching this somewhere, listening. Stop what you're doing for a second. The most important decision a human, please hear me today. Now, I'm not talking about church membership. I get it. We may not be your style, and that's cool. But you're here today. All right? And that thought, yeah, that's the Lord. If you've never done this, if you've never taken a step of faith, if you've never asked Jesus into your life, those of you listening or watching, take a chance. Give Jesus, a, j just give him the slightest window in your life and see what he'll do for you. We made it as simple as we possibly can. And I know there's religious people that don't even agree with how we do it. Okay, well, then you go on with your stuff, man. This is how we do it. I know, right? What can I say? I'm corny. Today is your day. Give Jesus a chance. 
all of us together as a church family, we're going to say this very simple prayer. Give Jesus a chance. Say it with us. Take a step of faith. Believe what you're saying. Doesn't mean you have it all together. Believe it and give Jesus a chance. Amen. Church, let's help him with this. Lord Jesus, come into my life and make me new. And from this day forward, Jesus is my Lord. Heaven is my home. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here's the deal. If you're in the room and you said it, find a friend, find a leader. Let somebody know. We, we want to give you a Bible. We would love to help you get started with some things. Those of you listening or watching, you got to tell somebody. Stop by here. Let us know. We'll hook you up with the Bible, get you started on your journey of faith. This is the day the Lord has made you all. Tomorrow, you be ready to share with somebody. Amen. God bless you all. We love you.